I don't like this episode. <laughs> Going back through it, I have reminded myself why I don't like this episode. And I've come up with a whole new reason why I don't like this episode. You see, this episode exists for one reason. With Ducat being shifted to being the true evil of Depths Past Nine, and they needed the Changelings to be seen in a better light. I mean, they've done all this work to show the Changelings is evil. We need to show a Changeling who's not evil. So then they show loss. Their solution for a changeling who isn't evil is an asshole. Uh, don't give me that. I can already hear the counter-argument. Oh, he's just different. He's just alien. No, he's a dick. He is a deliberate dick who deliberately provokes, who deliberately has no... Well, let's call it no civilization to him whatsoever. This is funny when we encounter him over an STO. <laughs> it's a fun fight. <laughs> It's actually one of the hardest ground fights in that game, in my opinion. Not not to the level of the Borg Queen, but certainly fun. <sighs> I, 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 okay, whatever. Let's just jump into the episode. So they've the first thing that happens is they drop out of warp in system in order to go the rest of the way not at warp. This is one of several times they've mentioned the possibility of not being at warp, you know, within a system, which the more I hear about it, the less it makes sense. And I just wanted to point that out because I've always been someone who believed that's a lot of hooey, especially given the fact that the number of times people in Star Trek warp in system actually outnumber the amount of times they don't. So if we're just counting score, you know, it's a bunch of hooey. But then I got thinking, because they're going at impulse, and I started wondering... How fast is full impulse? For the longest time, I've had this sort of mental presumption that full impulse was basically warp one, a.k.a. light speed. But I started to look into it because that was years ago. Like, that was back in, like, high school when I when I came to that presumption. And I, and I think it's one from, the, from, from one of the technical manuals. So I decided to pull out several additional technical manuals and do a little cross-referencing. And it turns out that we have no idea how fast impulse speed is. In fact, it turns out that the closest thing we have to a canon answer is that impulse speed depends on the engines in question. Literally, there are examples, even in the technical manuals, the Voyager technical manual in particular, of the idea that impulse speed for a ship is different than impulse speed for a shuttle, which is different than impulse speed for another ship, which is really inconsistent if you think about it. <laughs> also... Um, the Enterprise, uh, that would be the original Enterprise back in the motion picture, can manage one-third light speed on impulse, whereas Voyager, the intrepid class, doom ship of awesome, could manage one-fourth light speed at full impulse, whereas a shuttle can manage something closer to one-hundredth or something like that. It's just... I give up. <laughs> There's a, I, I really did try to come up with some kind of coherent answer here. Because at least if they're traveling at, say, light speed in system, that makes a little bit more sense. I mean, you're still going to have a several minute trip to go to and from in a system, but or several hour trip. I meant to look up how long it takes to, to cross the solar system at, at light speed, and I actually forgot to do it. The only, one I, the only figure I know off the top of my head is the nine minute mark, which is sun to here. <sighs> Anyways, moving on from that. You might be thinking, Laura, why are you discussing this? Well, ignoring the fact that I found it interesting, and the whole point is to discuss things that I find interesting, uh, I also have to admit that I don't want to talk about the episode proper, because it pisses me off. So, once again, we have an in instance, this is the second time this has happened in recent memory, uh, this happened in Season 6 with Little Ship, and now we've got a entity manages to enter a spaceship from outside. A spaceship. Think about that for a minute. Just just really process that. Now, I know that he can exist as flame, which by itself is kind of insane, and fog, okay. But anyways, let's, let's just move on. Let's just move on. So he shows up. Now, I'm going to go ahead and make fun of this immediately, because the first thing that happens is O'Brien does not immediately shoot the changeling coming aboard his ship, which is what he should have done. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's what he would have done. Giving a warning to a changeling? 
remember, they have absolutely no idea. They don't even have the beginnings of a concept this, that this might be one of the lost hundred. What they see is a founder invading their ship without attempting to communicate first. Think about that for a minute. Oh, yeah, I do want to give special praise to the design of the loss moves at impulse thing. It's actually pretty cool looking. Apparently, they designed a series of algorithms to, to generate the thing's animation rather than, you know, manually doing each part, which actually, weirdly enough, turned out pretty well because it makes it look a little more natural as it's flying around. That way they could just manually decide where it's going and what it's doing, and the general animation of movement could be handled by the algorithm. It turned out very well. Anyways. <clears throat> One thing I will give this episode is it does go out of its way to establish, like firmly establish, the truly alien nature of the founders. Because they are. They're one of the most alien entities we've ever encountered, at least in terms of what they are, in terms of their makeup. What's funny to me, though, is they've also done a huge amount to establish the nature of the mentality of the Founders, which is extremely understandable because we have people like that here in real life Earth. So, and like Laws, too. Well, let's just go down the list, because I took a lot of notes on this one. So, <clears throat> O'Brien should have fired immediately. He doesn't, of course. But then they're like, yeah, okay. So we want to release him from custody. How can you be sure? Well, he has no virus. I, I mean, you could link with him. I, I know that sounds horrible. It's like saying, Spock, you should mind meld with this person to interrogate them. And I understand how much that is a violation of privacy. But when it comes to something this important, I think you could be willing to bypass that. But no, he doesn't have the virus, which is funny because he actually does. Remember, at this point, Odo has been reinfected as of the beginning of Season 6. So he has an early stage of the virus, and thus he has just infected Loss with it. That's sure, that's okay, I'm sure he'll be cured off camera. <laughs> Which is actually what happened, they talked about that. Anyways, so they start talking. Okay. Uh, should I mention the ridiculous odds of finding one shuttle not going at warp with no sensors while in space? Not near anything. They're just out in space. Do you know how much space there is between Earth and Mars? Just, just like if you were to just make a cube of the space between Earth and Mars. Or maybe not even a cube. Well, it has to be a cube. But, you know, it, like, go, say, one mile tall, and then all that space in between the width of Earth and Mars. Think about how much space that is for a second. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's Star Trek. I'm just pointing this out because I hate this episode, and I want to spit on it as much as possible. I'm kidding. It just amuses me. <laughs> it really does amuse me. I can't even begin. They literally would have better odds of winning the lottery in real life than randomly stumbling into laws in space, or vice versa. I know, I know, I know. He had the call. He recognized, oh, and they have a genetic predisposition to go back home. That's why Oda wants to go home so much. Actually, they never say that. Instead, they have another take, which is also what pisses me off, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, Law starts talking, played by Hertzler. Now, I mean no insult to Hertzler whatsoever, but the man plays an asshole very well. He apparently tried to inflect a very specific speech pattern. Uh, he says he was patterning after Shatner, which is funny. Um, and it works very well. It makes me want to punch him nonstop. Just keep punching, punching. Like, I'm, I'm on my way home from work, you know, and... I come in, there's laws, and I just clobber him one. Ah, oh, okay, that's, that, that helps me run wine at the end of the day, just punching laws. Anyways, it really was satisfying to defeat him in STO. So Loss makes a point. All those people are alike. They have, that one has ridges, that one has bumps, that one has different skin color, but they're all the same. They're all humanoids who eat and drink and talk. We are not. We are alien. We are nothing like them. Now, that's the beginning of his point. I have a note here. I actually started making a list and I stopped. He is incredibly condescending. Constantly. There is a non-stop barrage of him belittling Odo and then the solids, the monoform, excuse me. And just, it, it never stops. In fact, it so never stops, it goes all the way till the very end when he finally leaves the scene. His last scene and his last lines of dialogue are being condescending and belittling. Some of you may or may not know this, but I've been accused of being Canadian before because of how polite I am. 
And one of the things that I just cannot abide is rudeness. It takes a lot for me to tolerate rudeness. And loss is immensely rude. Like, immensely is when you take immensely and immeasurably and smush them together. That's just how rude this guy is. <laughs> he... This is also when we find out that Odo stayed for Kira, and no other reason. The only reason Odo is not back with the Founders, war or no, is because of Kira. This is the other reason I don't like this episode. Now, this is probably obvious to most of you who are aware of the show, and as always, I would love to hear your thoughts. But I'm going to make an analogy first, and then I'm going to comment on something, and I hope that'll make my point for me. <clears throat> So, we have a show set during World War II, and it's set in Britain, and there's this one ex-Nazi, and the, he, does, he, was, he was born a Nazi, he, he was one of the Nazi people, and let's just assume the Nazis are all a species for some reason, to make this analogy kind of work, and he, obviously the Nazis, you know, they're at war, and they're, they're doing really, really, really horrible stuff. But, but you know, I just, I, this guy really wants to go back home to his Nazi people. That's where he belongs. But he falls in love with a woman, and so because he loves her, he stays. Not because they're Nazis, not because of the war, not because of the atrocities, not because of the anything else, but because she's there. Now, that's romantic and all, but that is actually insulting to the character of Odo, to think that he is so... I have no better word for this, that he is so wrong that he would be totally cool with just piecing off and joining the Great Link and becoming one of the founders, if not for Kira. Really. Now, part of the reason they kept hammering this point is because, I, I can't really talk about this without spoiling it, so please forgive me, uh, if you if you haven't seen the rest of the show, I'm about to spoil something. So spoilers, 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 spoilers. spoilers. So they knew that they, what they wanted to do with Odo at the end of the series finale. They knew where they were going with that well in advance. They've actually been doing several things to try and lay the groundwork for that up till you know as they're going through season seven. And this is that's like the entire point of this episode. It's an entire episode trying to establish why Odo would do that. I don't buy it. This is basically character assassination, which is not the first time they've done that in Season 7 with regards to a beloved character in DS9. And you kind of start to see, if I might diverge for just a second before I continue to make my point, I said at the beginning that by memory I don't really like Season 7 all that much. Season 6, absolutely, I love Season 6. And there are absolutely some really good gems in Season 7. Uh, we've already had... It's only a paper moon. Siege of AR-558. We have coming up inter enim frag I swear I'm going to look up how to pronounce that when we get there. You know, we have some very good episodes here. Individual episodes. But <sighs> there's just so much with Season 7 that it's hard for me to swallow. And that's just my opinion. A lore opinion. Thanks for watching. Let's continue to make my point. So the Nazi thing, right? Like, that's what they're saying Odo is. He is a Nazi. He is totally cool with being a Nazi, if not for the fact that he has his one true love. That's insulting. Second point I wanted to make with regards to this. <clears throat> As I said, they were trying to push Odo in this general direction. And this, this is something Star Trek does weirdly often. I've talked about it before. It's the you must be with your people thing, right? Voyager did this, too. TNG did it occasionally. TOS even did this every now and again. You must be with your people. You must be who you are, right? That kind of thing is something that Star Trek does weirdly often. You can't fit in. You're different. You should go back to your people, which... I don't know about you, but that feels... Well, incorrect. That feels like the exact opposite of what, what I believe in general, but also to the very point of Star Trek, the idea of... You know, all these people connecting despite or indeed because of their differences. But no, Odo should go be with his people. Why? This is the point Lars makes constantly. Loss, excuse me, not Lars. <laughs> Wrong show. And so we have more condescension. First thing he does is he talks about how humans suck. 
Then he talks about how primitives are better. Then he says civilization as a concept is wrong. And then he says you're so beneath me. <clears throat> it's the worst kind of condescension, too, in my opinion. Because it's the kind of condescension that has a modicum of backing behind it. Therefore, you can't dismiss it out of hand. I've, he is, I mentioned he is constantly belittling them and Odo. The way he belittles Odo is he treats Odo like a child. Oh, you'll see. You'll, you'll go through the same things I went through. If you're very lucky, you'll, you'll, you'll get to do, you'll, you'll get to watch her grow old and die, and this will all be horrible and blah, blah, blah. He's just constantly belittling him. He also makes a crucial logical flaw. He presumes that by virtue of experience, he knows with total certainty what's going to happen going forward. Uh, there's actually a term for that <laughs> we're not going to go into right now. His bias against monoforms is an excellent example of this. But remember, this is someone who didn't even know what linking is. And that he presumes so logically and naturally that he knows exactly what is best for Odo. And anytime Odo disagrees or dismisses him, he uses, to put it bluntly, an incorrect argument to try and make his point. <sighs> There's this bit where Odo says he doesn't like to remind people of an uncomfortable truth. In short, Odo is being polite. Loss then takes that and twists it into, you are denying who you really are. Now... It, it, this is part of why the episode bothers me, because the episode leaves the door open for the possibility that Odo really is denying who he is, which admittedly is not cool. I mean, it, there's a big gray gradient in between always being yourself and being what you can for others. That's the nature of society and indeed civilization, which I wanted to come back to that point. Because the whole point of civilization is that it's all part of this intangible this intangible gray morass in between people and how we interact with each other. I obviously, like I said, I lean more towards the side of politeness than not, but even then, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny who and what I am, right? I'm not going to, to use a very mild example, pretend I don't like Star Trek just to get along with someone better. Because at that point, that's not being polite, that's lying, that's, that's moving too far down the gradient. It could still be done for polite reasons, but in my opinion, that's going too far. And you could see why that's relevant, especially in a modern society, where people accepting and acknowledging who and what they are is kind of important to people, right? Especially in Star Trek, which, again, is supposed to be all about all of us kind of fitting together, despite and indeed because of the fact that we are different. But no. No, Odo. You are holding back who you are. Now... <clears throat> The episode does gain some points back with Kira. Not a visitor, not a visitor is awesome as always, but the point is that she has a wonderful bit where she actually apologizes to Odo and says, I'm sorry I can't link with you. Note the difference in tone and approach. Loss, I, I can't do it, looks down at Odo and says, you don't understand. They don't understand. They are beneath us. Allow me to elucidate onto you your many failing. Kira looks equal to Odo and says, I am sorry you cannot experience something that is integral to who you are with me. The episode will return to that point later, too. So then, Loss just starts joking. And, excuse me, I'm saying that wrong. Odo starts joking with Loss, trying to reach out to him, trying to establish some kind of civilization, communication, coordination, interaction, teamwork thing. And Loss just is brusque and rude and insists on linking. <laughs> I'm starting to think the guy's addicted. Maybe linking really is just drugs. <sighs> uh, then he does the fog thing. Now, the fog thing is interesting. Because on the one hand, you could say... That he, the defense Odo gives is he's only doing what comes naturally to him, right? Okay, yeah, that that's cool. Do you know what comes naturally to a human? I'll give you a hint. It's not just about anything you'll see a human actually doing in a society of civilization. And this is why I keep hammering this point, by the way. If you pay attention, the episode portrays Loss as someone who is basically a 
I don't actually know if there's an official term for this, a primitivist. Someone who's like, we should go back to being what we naturally are. Basically reverting to what is effectively a beast state. He even mentions how much he prefers the so-called primitive life forms because they just do what they're supposed to do. They do what comes naturally to them. And let's say, let me use a direct example because this is brought up over on Voyager. Let's say that you're walking along and you see, insert someone who is attractive to you, you know, whatever gender, and they're just super gorgeous. Just picture that if you will. Or don't, that's cool too. Now, to be blunt, it is natural for you to try to basically mount that person on the spot. No, it is. If we, I think we can all accept this thanks to biological imperatives. I guess this depends on age range as well. But thanks to biological imperatives, thanks to the nature of how and what you are, that is a natural urge. Now, I I'm use this example ju to make a point, just like I did with the Nazi example, because I'm trying... The, the episode slants this as if it's acceptable, but it's not. We, as civilized people, have learned to suppress and control our natural urges. Generally speaking, you don't see someone just pull down their pants and go to the bathroom in the middle of the subway. That's a bad example. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did that one on purpose. But you get my point. There are many things that we have decided as a people to suppress and control, you know, very Vulcan-like, if you will, in order to better coordinate and interact with each other, to form this gray fabric in between us that I've referenced several times, the very concept of civilization. Now, I think that's a good thing, because personally, I think things would be a lot worse if we all just ran around like animals. That's just my opinion, admittedly. But the episode constantly tries to phrase this as if doing what comes naturally is the right thing to do. You're starting to see why this episode pisses me off so much. So, he turns into a fog. And what I love best about this is this helps to showcase how much of an asshole Loss is. Because he is deliberately and knowingly provoking people in order to try and provoke a response so that he can then push into his his philosophy onto Odo. He's effectively constructing a straw man and saying, aha, see, I was right, you should come with me. You should come with me right now. You don't belong here. You belong with your people. Right? So, he provokes the Klingons very, very obviously and deliberately, in fact, and then, you know, he mentions, oh, there's no there's stench. There, there would be no stench on my hands. And then, of course, the mind's bigger. I mean, really. That's the second time that line has been said on Star Trek. Both times in episodes I don't care about, or don't care for. Anyways, and then, of course, he stabs the Klingon with intent to kill. And successfully does so. Congratulations. What then happens is a series of, huh? Now, I mentioned the benefits of civilization here, but what I find most interesting is that they try to showcase the, ad, the concepts of civilization in a negative light as they specifically focus in on the legal side of things and the variance of exactly whether or not Loss was acting in self-defense or not. Now, I'm sorry. Uh, Loss was, in fact, both provocative and acting in self-defense. Now, knowing what I do, does that excuse killing? Uh, no. Of course it doesn't. But to be completely clear, the idea that this is a straight-up murder is also not true. But I don't want to get into that. The point being that he decides to go ahead and, you know, allow this to happen. Just to make his point. You, you don't understand, Odo. You, sh you should be with me. You, me. Let's go. Can we link? Oh, God, I, I haven't linked in five minutes. <laughs> so this then leads to Quark's speech. Quark gives this nice big speech about how we're all just beasts. <laughs> I don't like this speech all that much. It's an interesting speech, but I don't buy it for a millisecond. Because the whole point of his speech is that you are different and you should keep that hidden away because it would make me uncomfortable and it would make everyone else uncomfortable too, you freaking weirdo. 
and of course, I'm, I, I should just list the rest of his speech too, because the rest of his speech is, we as humanoids have evolved thanks to genetics, or I'm saying this in the wrong order. We have genetics that have developed thanks to how we've evolved that tell us that something that is dangerous is something, or something that is unknown is something that's dangerous. This is kind of like me making the argument that if I were to, ah, geez, I can't even come up with a good analogy for this one. Um, because of the fact that I like drinking water, therefore, I should guzzle gasoline. There's a huge fallacy in this argument, because he's doing a disconnected argument. He is saying A, therefore unconnected B. So here's the problem. His whole point is, you're, it's, it's unknown, it's different, it's dangerous. But, see, the problem is, that only applies if Odo is an unknown, which he's not. He might have been an unknown, like, seven years ago. At this point in time, Odo is very much a known. Not because he takes our shape, but because we know who and what he is. <laughs> I'm going to let it go. So, the episode then manages to actually impress me, because its finale and denouement are actually pretty awesome. Kira lets Laws go. Notice Loss doesn't say thank you at all, by the way. Because he's an asshole. And Kira is like, I don't know what happened. It's weird. He just warped through, and I, I guess he could turn into plasma, and he escaped. I, I got nothing. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Cute. <clears throat> now, I, I've said before that I, I'm not in the favor of you know, rudeness. I, I have to admit, the Klingons were probably angling to get Loss killed. For no good reason, it is worth noting. For no good reason. You are a founder, therefore you must die. Eh. I mean, if I have to explain why I don't believe in the very concept of you are of X species or tribe, therefore you share all the crimes of X species or tribe, then I don't know what to tell you. Nevertheless, the idea of Kira letting him go, I'm with that. You know, they, they, Odo is very pleased by it. Kira tells him where to find him, and then Kira leaves. Now, this is actually surprisingly subtle in its own right. I don't think it's even deliberate, to be completely honest with you. I don't think this is part of the intent of the writers. But the episode then shows how everything that's established about loss and his point and how, you know, what doing what's natural and being with your people is all a load of hooey that is wrong. <laughs> this is the one redeeming point of this episode. In fact, I gotta be a hundred percent blunt. If not for this denouement and finale, I'd, I'd be willing to consider this for lamentation status. I really don't like this episode. But right at the end, Kira does what is not natural to her. She does not do what her bestial instincts tell her to do. She does what her intangible, gray morass, civilization thoughts tell her to do. She lets Odo go. She gives him the opportunity to go and explore the galaxy with one of his kind because she knows how important and valuable that is to him and is willing to take this loss, take this sacrifice, solely for the sake of another, with no selfish intent. That's awesome in its own right. Then, Odo goes to see Loss, and as he does so, Loss continues to be the same smug, condescending asshole that he's been this whole time. And as a consequence, he basically destroys his own point, because Loss is being incredibly selfish, and has been basically since, uh, I'd say, like the third or fourth scene he's been in. Because all he cares about is himself, and what the tangible ideas are, the, the natural, the beast, this is what we really are, this is what we must be. And that's what he thinks, and that's what he wants, and he believes he knows what is best for Odo. And so he presumes what is best for Odo, whereas Kira offers what she thinks is best for Odo. And you could see then the dynamic of both Kira versus Loss, and the way that they both circle around Odo in completely different ways from completely different attitudes. Odo even offers to link at the end, and Loss is like, nah. I'm gonna go make the new link and be an STO. Bye. I should replay that mission just, just for fun. And then, to really nail the point down, Odo comes back and Kira's shocked. Odo chose to do what was not natural, 
chose to do what is not beast-like in order to choose something that really is actually very unnatural for him. If he was another humanoid, you know, the ideas of biological reproduction and all that could be argued here, but they can't here. Odo doesn't have any of that. He has no biological imperative. He has no natural tendency towards love. It is only the intangible, unnatural, civilized tendency towards love that drives him back to Kira. And, final point, despite all the episode's constant points about how you're different, you're weird, you're different, you're weird, you're different, you're weird, at the end, Odo basically does the closest thing to linking that he can with Kira. Just to show that she accepts him and loves him as he is, not just as she presumes he is, and that despite the fact that they are different, they can still connect on a deeply personal level, completely torpedoing the rest of the points of the episode. I would almost be willing to say that a separate writer came in and altered that ending, to be completely honest, because it's, it's actually surprisingly well constructed in how thoroughly and efficiently it destroys the rest of those arguments. And I love it. And special praise to the scene with Kira too. It's actually qu quite heartwarming. Uh, apparently they were inspired by Aurora Borealis. You can kind of tell when you look at it. So with that surprisingly good finale, you can see why I was like, uh, no, nope, this, this doesn't even come close to lamentation territory. Now, I have a feeling I'm going to have a lot of disagreements <laughs> in the comment section today. So as ever, looking forward to your thoughts and comments. I'll see you next time, guys. Wait, this isn't natural! This isn't how my hands are supposed to be! <laughs>